And one of the reasons you want to do that, the reason you are looking for that, that ragged edge of range, and finding those corners, doing all that stuff, is you are keeping your opponent on guard as much as you possibly can. The option is to keep them on guard while you're relaxed. Keep them tense while you're at ease. Sometimes, it, sometimes you got to fake it. Sometimes you got to look like you're attacking while you are staying relaxed to make them defend themselves needlessly. This high game stuff we're talking about here. But uh, we're going to get into hopefully the end of the session a uh, whole section on how do you fake? How do you throw a good fake? That's my bread and butter back home. That's how I live. I'm making the openings without wasting my energy. Okay. All right, so we talked about offense, talked about sword mechanics, talked about range as defense, and now we're going to talk about shields as defense. That's most typical. Who's in the pool? Ah, two weapon fighters. Do they know? Most common weapon style, shield. And it allows me to talk about these principles more easily because it separates defense and offense more, more better than two sword or two weapon whatever. Okay? Even single, even two handed weapon. Separating offense and defense is next to impossible because one must be part of the other. Okay? So with sword and shield, we know that sword is for killing guys with Shield is for stop and die. Right? That's the basic split there. Alright? Lots of different kinds of shield. I don't believe there's one right type of shield, one best type of shield. Just like in your stance. Your shield is a series of compromises and decisions that you have to make. Center grip is very popular now. I think it's, it's overtaken and past uh, strap shields. I'll probably like two, three, one. Go around now. Um, I still fight with a strap heater because I like the advantages that it gives me compared to a center. I fought with both. I fought when I started. When I started fighting back in those long ago days, like I talked about. State of the art shield, 24 inch flat round shield, strapped to your arm. That was it. Another strap in your hand, flopping all over the place. It was nuts. I can't believe most of us survived. Because we also didn't wear any armor. Despite what you may have heard. I wore, what I used to wear for armor then is what I wear under my armor now. But, so, what are the relative advantages, disadvantages of a center grip compared to a strap? Who first with a okay, who, who first with a center grip? Anybody with a strap? Okay, uh, two, one, two, three, three. So, sir, your name? Baldwin. Baldwin? Yeah. Okay. You talking about the center group? Yeah, yeah. What's the advantage? Uh, it's a lot more mobile to me. I, I can place it pretty much anywhere that I want. And there's not a whole lot of uh, places where I can put it. Okay. Because it, it, I can get it further away from me, and there's only one place where I'm holding it. One place where you're holding it is also tweak. I, I completely agree. Okay, we'll get to that. So, who's placing the strap to you? Okay. What are the adventures? Ah, there you are. Lovely. Well, all the passive defense, especially the bigger ones. The bigger it is, the more passive any is. The bigger you set the grip around, the more passive the offense. I think what the difference is, you know, rather than using passive and aggressive, active and step. Shield tends to be more static. Partly because it's shield, yes? Sorry. How about stability? Same as leverage, I think. But yes, that is that's the big difference between a strap shield and a center grip shield. Stability. Stability. Um, the, what was I saying? Static. The strap shield tends to be a little more static. Usually, if it's a heater, in particular, it's a more it's a more efficient shape. 
because you've got corners to these. And it allows you to block more parts of it, excuse me, more targets with smaller movement than around you. Particularly center. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that I can put this shield anywhere you can put a center. As far as the game will cover. The two differences zone coverage and weapon coverage. Use them both way, both, both weapons, both shields, both weapons. Although, heater shield tends to lend itself to zone cover. I know the sword's coming at my head, so I'm going to cover that part of my head. He's throwing it at my leg, I'm going to cover that part of my leg. He's throwing it to my outside, I'm going to cover that part of my outside. Very small movements. Right? Center grip, do you have your hand? Take right away. So, now what he's done here is pretty much passively cover all of the zones. But he's having to hold it all the way from his body and all that weight is in his hand. Okay. Which one do you think is going to be faster to move if they're at the same weight? This one is strapped to my arm, or this one where he's carrying all the weight in his hand. This one. Probably. They're the same weight. Okay. He also, while you're going around, you've got to move, you've got to expose a lot more targets from one shot to another than I do. The advantage he's got, though, is like he says, he can keep it right behind his back. He's I, I can do that to some extent, but it actually makes me quite over when I do that. I also have a problem if I over rotate my shield just a little bit, I'm now out of position and I'm over. His movements are very much up and down. He's going to rock the movement. And he can rely on his sword too. And I, and I do. Oh, oh, one more thing. But, but, here's the, the single weakness, single greatest weakness of the yep. I can maneuver that while he's in. Because all he's got is that one contact point. This. He can resist it, but only not until that comes up against his arm. Okay? If it's flat out, he's not showing to me flat. Don't know how to attack. Can't do that with this shield. You have to drag my whole body. Okay? So he's now. However, he's aware of all those weaknesses, right? And you're going to avoid situations where you're susceptible to that weakness. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. He knows what the weaknesses are, but there are weaknesses, there are compromises he's making. Okay? He's not going to let me get in this way. Right? Ah, so he takes that back edge away from me immediately. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. It's, both styles are bad. Both styles have advantages and disadvantages. You've got to decide for yourself. Can you personally utilize those advantages and disadvantages more than enough. Okay? Those are the two primary my heater is different than everybody else's heater where I come from. I don't I'm a very narrow heater, I don't have a deep belly on it, which actually helps the guard your offside and there's lots of little little things about individual shields. This the shield is round which actually will be a little more vulnerable to a leg shot and a mobile, for instance. Um, a little more recovery for your opponent off of the strap than around. If I hit your shield on a strap, I get more, more energy back from the bounce for another shot. You can. If I get a center grip, I get nothing back to help with the recovery. But by the same token, that allows you a little more oomph and you might have just been able to blast right through that shield. Because what's happened there is that shield is, has given mm -hmm. with the shot. I don't see any reason why another type of defense with bow shields is not just to meet it and stop it, but to deflect it. And that's what I like to try and do, whenever, even when I'm fighting with this. With any sword shot coming in, I'm not just going to try and stop it, although it's certainly valid to do so. I'm going to try and pop it over my head, all right? So that the sword goes over, and I don't, like Peter said, he can't just 
use the, the bounce to recover. It's now gone past and he's got to get it back to somewhere where he can throw a shot at it. Watch, you have to put him out of position. Correct. And that comes from my history of fighting the two. Same thing, I'm trying to do that all the time. I'm not trying to just meet his shot with an equal force. I'm trying to absorb his force and dump it off and use that to move into a more advantageous position for myself. So, same with the leg shot. I'll let, sometimes I will let the leg shot just blast through the bottom corner of my shield so that my opponent can't immediately recover. I'll take a light shot on the leg after it's gone through my shield. Because now it's gone through here, taking all the energy out, it's dead on my leg. No good. And he's got to haul it all the way back from a dead spot. You ever find yourself doing that? Using that dead spot on your shield to take a, to absorb a guy's shot? That's rolling around it? Definitely. Yeah. All right. That, that's one of the reasons why I fight with uh, a round shield instead of, say, like with an oval or something like that. There's no corners for the shot to really, to really plant on for them to, to recoil back. There, there's nothing really for it to really stick to. So I'm always moving the shield back and forth, letting the, the blows almost pass. Old school martial arts kind of water versus earth. Yeah, right. And none of this, none of this stuff is new, right? I, okay. Um, one thing uh, I find with a heater, the way I use my heater, and the way a lot of guys use the round, another uh, tendency with a center grip shield is to blind. You can use it to blind your opponent more easily with a center grip, but you can also blind yourself. You've got to be careful to make sure that you keep it tipped out when you're in close range, right? If you don't, or if your opponent can turn that in, you blind it. It's a lot harder to do against a, a strap shield. Okay. And even that, even so, if I, if I put my shield like this, like he was presenting with that round shield, he has to keep it at a, at a height at which he can see down to my knees, basically, right? Are you, are you always having to look over it from time to time? It's kind of like... Uh, I'll, I like to angle my shield back. That way I can see all the way to your feet. Excellent. So that's exactly the next thing I was going to say. When my heater's in position here, it's covering my face, right? Face dress up very hard. But I've got an angle in such a way that I'm looking over the top of it with my left eye and underneath it with my right eye. So I can see not, this does not get in my way at all. I can see everything from this position. Now, of course, sometimes you know, I'll pop up a block and that blinds me over there. But if I've got my opponent centered properly, I can still see where he is. I still see where all of his movement is going. And predict his shot without having to see where his hand is. Okay? Does that make sense? Does anybody have a question about their particular shield, how they use it? Is, I don't know, how, how do I get like a center grip a teardrop with an with a off-angle grip? Right? What's the secret to that? It's not a secret. It's from my hand. Well, I mean, so, so, what do you, you obviously use that shield because you think it does something for you. What does it do? Put it where I want it, get it out of the way of my sword, okay. while keeping it in the way of his. Alright. Uh, another thing about the center grip shield is it tends to be more instinctive. And some more advanced fighters will go to it eventually because they already understand the movement in the range and all that stuff. Center grip is very instinctive because you're basically blocking with a fist. The heater, the other hand, while in more efficient shape, it's only efficient if you know how to use it. Right? You've, got to, you've got to learn those small movements and be able to do them without thinking about it and know just how far. I've only got to move my shield that far to block my arm. If I do that, I'm wasting in a lot of it. You know, to block my leg, I try and block my leg out here instead of here. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, but ideally, my defense, I'm trying to take that leg shot out while it's out here. So it's just a little pop of the shield for the leg shot, a little pop of the shield for the head shot, a little, a little head movement and a little rotation of the upper body for the opposite. You know, when I, notice when I do that, my shield corner comes over, my elbow drops to my body, and this whole side is covered. So it's learning how to use whatever shield you've got. 
once you understood all of its advantages and disadvantages. You can't despise a guy because he's using a particular kind of shield. It's like, hey, he's just got a center grip. I'll take that. Nah. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Right? Stuff here. When you're. Oh, who's up? Uh, anybody gone out and watched Sir Gemini's? videos. He's got a very interesting theory about a lot of stuff and I think part of it derives from he's, he's really trying to turn what he knows into a system that he, can, that he can teach and that he can teach other people to teach. Because that's really what a system allows. Most martial arts systems are about how to teach, not about how to execute. This is one of these Bruce Lee sort of rebelled against. I'm not, I'm not going to teach you a system, even though his later students started calling it a system. He never called it a system. He did kind of what I'm doing. He came up with principle. He said, your body moves this way. The blow has to go through this much space to have this much power. And so on and so on. Okay? So, I don't have a system. Gemini's ideas about the vulnerabilities of individual sword shapes, very interesting. Um, and, and true to an extent. But it doesn't really take into account the fact that your shield moves and changes its, its orientation. Maybe it does. Maybe it does when you actually buy his class and go there and work out his soleil. I, I don't see it so much in the videos I've watched. Maybe I haven't seen all of them. So. Well, I think the videos teach you like can we teach you like, what's, what, all right, what's the good parts of this, what's the bad parts of this? Well, the mechanical weaknesses of, yes, yeah, and that's all valid. Um, he also has an interesting concept of, of rotational block, where he kind of takes this basic sort of a stance with a little buckler, and any shot that somebody throws, he just sort of turns, turns into it. And he's kind of in the way of it. Kind of. You know? But yeah, all your defense is right in front of you. You just turn it to me, whatever offense is coming at you. Of course, that's valid. But what I talked about earlier, where the hand is quicker than the body, and the body is quicker than the feet. If you're having to move your feet to accomplish every defensive move, you're slow. Your hands can defend quicker. Most martial arts will teach you to defend with your leg. They teach you to defend the kick with your hands because it's quicker. Because he has started the race before you. Failing that, when you need more strength in your defense, when you need to bolster that defense, the body, turning the body, the upper body only, to meet that attack. It's preferable to turning your whole body, reorienting your whole body and your stance to meet a single attack. Okay? Does that make sense? Anybody got a rebuttal for that? Anybody? No? Well, of course. I mean, sometimes changing for this, because now you change the range, too. You never move the that's what I was just talking about. Yeah, this, this is a little stronger than I don't say that there isn't any validity to it at all. Because like I said, sometimes I'll get into a position like this where I'm in very close range. Sometimes my best defense is to actually slide back out, take that whole big step. It's slow, but I'm already in my defense. Sometimes from here, you know, uh, I don't really have a good shot here, but if I step back to here, oh, now maybe I do. Now maybe I can free my short shoulder up to get that shot, you know, or vice versa. You know, here, like that, right? But that's all offensive. He's trying to just trying to hit me. Say you're trying to throw a rep. There, I'm going to move my body first. Boom. But I might change this angle afterwards. 
block is accomplished with the arm and the upper body, They're not with the rotation. So you have to spend a more time on that. Going over the one, one drawback to the, to the center grip, if you're starting out with the center grip, so you can overreact. It's this very instinctive punching at the attack. But you don't need to. That shield is, however big, that little movement is probably all it takes to block almost all your targets. Your probably hands are moving much more than a one foot circle. Okay. Dre, could you do that just what you did one more time? Because there's a point I've been trying to make with some folks. I'd like you to do that one more time, what you just did with the, the block. Oh, uh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can relate to your weirdness. <laughs> you have no idea. I've seen it as well. I've got it. This is the most. Yeah, maybe the tunnel you're trying to get across. Well, one of, the, one of the things you're doing when you talk about strong movements right, is that a lot, of, a lot of people don't get it. If you're moving your hips a little bit, you help people not to overblock. And if you move your hips correctly, you don't overblock. Just that much is enough to block. But if you're moving with just your hands, then you're doing this and you're getting hands out of position. So if you rotate just that much, well, like just when you were doing it, you were saying, you know, I just do these small movements, your hips are moving. You may not even be conscious, but I'm trying to draw that into people. Rotate around the hip, and the smaller movement is much easier. As well as tired. Yeah, just move the defense. Yeah, yeah. But if you have to do that, that slow is out of position. It's tired. It's tired. But all you gotta do is keep it kind of in position. And do yes. Make a little movement here. I don't feel like I'm moving my. I move my hips a little. Yeah, you're moving your my shoulders. Little motions. That's yeah, just what you're saying. Don't overblock. Small motions. So, thing about your offense, a smaller, more efficient movement is more effective. Right? It tires you out less, gives less time for your opponent, gives your opponent less information. That's always what you're trying to do. You're trying to learn as much as you can from them and tell them as little as possible. Great. Questions? Alright. You see, we got anything else? Okay. So I've been saying along, all along, uh, I want you to take away from this class just some principles. I don't have any brand new techniques to show you. There aren't any. I don't think. I don't think anybody at this point, after 50 years, we're going to invent a new shot that nobody's <laughs> ever seen before. Really. We've pretty much run out of it. We know what works. We got a pretty good idea what doesn't work. So now, so we're brand. We're, although saying that, after 50 years, we're still kind of a new sport, really. I mean, compared to say competitive judo or competitive taekwondo. Well, competitive taekwondo is what 30, 40 years ago. Seven years, okay, so that's 30, 40, that's not bad. Um, but, but even that, that's a martial sport, just like what we're doing, right? Their techniques are limited, just like, kind of like ours. Certain techniques work better than others for their sport. So that's what they practice, that's what they concentrate on. You watch high-end martial arts practitioners in any, any martial arts. You'll find that they come down to about five or six blows that they can do and over and over and over again. Even Bruce Lee again said, I don't fear the man who knows 10,000 kicks. I fear the man who's done one kick 10,000 times. Refine and perfect. We don't need to be, we don't need to go out and learn 40 techniques that you can't practice every day. You want to learn half a dozen techniques that you can practice over and over and over again until you are so good with them that your opponent doesn't even understand what you're doing. Even though it's a basic thing, it's just a basic thing. You know? 
what it comes down to again is that seven. All of these principles are just things that you're going to practice so that when you get to the setup, you don't have to think about what you're doing. Your body knows it, understands it, and you can teach it to somebody else. And if I've said this, I'm going to go over what I said at the beginning. If I've said this, you've heard this ten times before, I hope you hear it ten more times. Because if it's been worth saying ten times, it must be important. If Ten different guys from ten different kingdoms all come here and tell you the same things. Where we overlap, that is the truth. Everything else is that guy's perception. Where we overlap, that's the key. We can distill all of this stuff, and that's what I'm trying to do. We can distill all this stuff down to a few things where we can teach just those few things, and then everybody can go off and become a Grand Master all on their own. That would be ideal. So that's what I'm trying to do. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. session. This isn't going to go on the video. So lucky you, you're all here. We're going to do a little thing called selling the thing. Okay? See you around.